Mystery of Shakespeare. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare, the man. Integrated Ticket. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in Southeast Queensland. So we have introduced a paper ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in Southeast Queensland. So bus, train, and ferry. And the second stage of integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, so to put value on the card and then to use the card for traveling around the system. The ocean. The ocean has been getting bluer according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that's because the ocean has been getting warmer. Nanotechnology. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer identified two topics. Nanoscience is the study of phenomenon and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular, and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is. But loosely speaking, people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of a hundred nanometers or less. Carbon rich soils. Rebuilding carbon rich agriculture soils is the only real productive permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She is frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year, Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Daniel Harris, a scholar of consumption and style, has observed that until photography finally supplanted illustration as the primary means of advertising clothing in the 1950s, glamour adhered less in the face of the drawing, which was by necessity schematic and generalized, than in the sketch's attitude, posture, and gestures, 
especially in the strangely dainty positions of the hands. Glamour once resided so emphatically in the stance of the model that the faces in the illustrations cannot really be said to have expressions at all, but angles or tilts. Illustrations cannot really be said to have expressions at all, but angles or tilts. The chin raised upwards in a haughty look, the eyes lowered in an attitude of introspection, the head cocked at an inquisitive or coquettish angle, or the profile presented in sharp outline, emanating power, the severity, like an emperor's bust embossed on a Roman coin. I think it's really important for young people not to feel restricted in their choices and also to be aware of the choices that are available to them. And obviously the media has an incredibly important role to play in that. I think we tend to talk about science as this big kind of monolith, but of course actually it's this beautiful multifaceted thing. You know there's almost something for everybody there. And there are so many different aspects of it. You know, somebody that's going to be attracted to working in biology might be a very different person from somebody who's attracted to engineering. I suppose it's about knowing the breadth of opportunities that are out there. And so anything that universities and broadcast media can do to make sure that those opportunities are visible. These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork, or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. We've decided to adopt, just as a loose theme for the course, a biological theme so that you can see the connections between chemistry and biology and the things you might consider doing in the future. We want you to think about the molecules that are relevant to your body, the processes that occur in your body, the chemistry that's going on and how energy plays a role. And we've divided the course into four sections and after each section there will be a midterm. The first one is about matter. The thing that makes it difficult is because even if life had evolved on Mars, the chances of being preserved are very small. If we use Earth as a reference and our planet is teeming with life, yet it rarely preserves evidence of life of the fossil record. And the focus now is on exploring for habitable environments. If you're looking for water, a source of energy, either solar energy or thermal energy or chemical energy, and then organic carbon, assuming life as we know it on Earth based on carbon. So those are sort of the three things that we're looking for in the course of our mission.
Unless you're at a Chaucer convention, speaking Middle English is not going to impress a potential romantic partner in 2013. Similarly, male savanna sparrows have to make sure their vocalizations are up to date. Researchers analyzed three decades of recordings of male savanna sparrows, and birds that changed their tune over the years did better with the ladies. The research is in the journal Animal Behavior. While introductory notes of the sparrow song stayed the same, the middle and end parts changed over time. In the 1980s, songs concluded with longer, high-pitched trills. More recent songs contain a series of clicks in the middle and a shorter, low-pitched trill at the end. Researchers found that the male sparrows that adopted the newer songs had higher rates of sexual reproduction because you don't want to be seen as behind the times. Indeed, Chaucer might have had his pick of the ladies in the 14th century, but few today can make heads or tails of his tales. People with asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and other breathing disorders need fast relief when their airways tighten up. Unfortunately, the most commonly used medication has obnoxious side effects. But scientists recently discovered that a bitter taste can be a more effective treatment, and now they know why. The work is published in PLOS Biology. When an asthma attack hits, the airway shrinks and makes breathing difficult. To keep air flowing, the sufferer must take medication to relax the passage's muscles and open it back up. But a couple years ago, researchers discovered airways contained bitter taste receptors like the ones on the tongue. After exposure to bitter substances, the receptors can expand the airway more quickly and more effectively than the most commonly used treatment. Researchers examined airway tissue to learn why bitterness makes the muscles relax. During an asthma attack, calcium flows into the cells of the airway and contributes to muscle contraction. But bitter substances block the channels that allow calcium into cells, which relaxes the tightened tissue. And that's the opposite of a bitter pill. Sharing is one of the hallmarks of human behavior. Give me a cookie, and I'm more likely to give you one later. But our bonobo cousins have an odd variation on the practice. They share with strangers before friends. The findings in the journal PLOS One. Researchers tested bonobo sharing in experiments involving 14 of the apes. All were born in the wild. In the primary experiment, bonobos were placed in a cage with food, and they could choose to admit either a known member of their group, a stranger, or both. In 51 trials, most bonobos shared the feast, but they let the stranger in first. Why choose an outsider over a friend? In another experiment, the scientists found bonobos only shared when doing so led to a social interaction. Giving up some food to strangers lets these apes expand their social network. This behavior may have evolved to promote social tolerance, in contrast with chimps' sometimes deadly aggression against strangers, which means that even when food is offered, there's still no such thing as a free lunch.